Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivas. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And today we're going to talk about something that's been, that I get asked about a lot that uh, some of you know about, some of you don't know. We're going to talk about CAC score. And we're going to break that down and give you some information about it. What's the CAC score? It's called the Coronary Artery Calcium Score. And it really is a measurement of your vascular health, particularly the health of your arteries when it comes to damage that we've done to them, particularly in the modern era in the nutritional sense. So what happens in the blood vessels? You know, I'm going to tell a really cool anecdote. When I was um, training, when I was in my residency, and I did a couple of residencies, but the one I'm talking about right now is the University of Toronto, Go Canada, loved my time in, in Toronto. And I worked with a guy <laughs> called Dr. Maggiano. He was at Sunnybrook Hospital, which is the big trauma hospital, just a, a solid character, but technically one of, the mo one of the best technical surgeons I've ever come across. And I did a lot of work with him. And Maggiano was a vascular surgeon. And this is in the early 90s when we were still seeing a ton of people that came from the smoking era with smoking vascular damage commonest cause of vascular damage at that time. And we were starting to see the carbohydrate groups come in more and more. The people that were eating carbohydrates, the diabetics, with their vascular disease. And by the way, the vascular disease that diabetics get or, or uh, insulin resistant people is the truth, is the real word. And smokers, nicotine users, nicotine users, and carbohydrate users, those two drugs, yeah, carbohydrates are a drug, cause very, very similar vascular disease. We'll go into that in a little bit. But the coolest part, when I was operating with Madge, uh, this was before the radiologists took over treating triple A's and vascular aneurysms, and before cardiologists were putting stents in. This was in the previous era where a surgeon was really, the, a vascular surgeon was the only way you could fix your blood vessels. And we got every day guys coming in with ruptured triple A's or bleeding triple A's, abdominal aortic aneurysms. And we would operate on these guys. It was always this wonderful, exciting operation, not so wonderful for the patient, but we'd crack them open, we'd cut their bellies open, um, we'd have a CT scan and you open up that blood vessel, you clamp it and you open up the blood vessel. And the vessels looked, when you open them up, they were just clogged with this gelatinous, snot. I mean, think about when you've got a cold and you blow out a big hueley and you stick that in someone's blood. That, I know that's a disgusting scenario, but that's, that's the best scenario I could come up with. When you're really sick and you got a cold and you go, Bleh! and you cough up that gray, yellow, black, disgusting snot. That's the slime that was in those people's blood, that is in those people's blood vessels. And you can take it and you can scoop it out. And sometimes you see little part particles of calcium. It almost looks like little bits of bone or little chips of bone in those blood vessels. And we'd scrape those out and we'd go to the neck where it started and sew in a graft. And we'd have to be very meticulous about sewing. That's where I learned my surgical technique more so than anybody else. He was a perfectionist and he taught me very, very good surgical technique. We'd sew in that graft and then revascularize them. And sometimes some of that snot would go down and uh, I get into it, but what would happen, that snot would go down and clog off the small blood vessels. So from time to time, we'd lose a toe because of that. But we really would wash that out and be very, very careful. Same thing when we did uh, coron uh, 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 carotid artery aneurysms um, or carotid artery blockages, exactly the same disease. And it was directly related, folks, directly related to nicotine. I didn't say smoking. I said nicotine. I said, nicotine, I'm happy to be challenged on that. Because right now, most of you don't know this, but between 35 and 65% of all high school kids vape using nicotine on a daily basis. And we're going to see that cohort get into vascular trouble. I, I digress. So what we're looking at is all this gelatinous snot. But now let's go back into the laboratory and figure out where that gelatinous snot comes from. Because that gelatinous snot, by the way, is fat. It's fat. And it's so easy to look at that and say, oh my God, the fat in his diet is clogging up his blood vessels. But it wasn't happening to people he didn't smoke. It wasn't happening in people who were not diabetic or morbidly obese. We didn't see that vascular injury. So something about obesity, diabetes, and something about smoking 
cause that. And smokers and obese people don't eat any differently. They eat the same food. So why is it the people that eat a ton of fat but don't smoke and don't eat a lot of carbohydrates don't have that injury? But we demonized fat. We became lipophobic as a society. And it hasn't solved that problem. So it's not fat that causes this. But here's the way it works, folks. If you look at a blood vessel, a blood vessel uh, is a tube. And it's got kind of an elastic outer coating, a muscular elastic outer coating. And on the inside, there's a lining of cells called the endothelial cells. And they've got a little membrane called the basement membrane, and they attach to this thing called the basement membrane. And those cells are nice and flat and smooth, and they're touching, holding hands, very smooth surface, and the blood just slides by these vessels. And the vessels can get wider and narrower, um, and those endothelial cells can swell up a little bit or shrink down a little bit. But what happens is nicotine and sugar, nicotine and elevated levels of sugar, very rapidly go from the bloodstream into those cells. And the swells, because especially with sugar, the cells swell up because sugar carries water in with it. But both nicotine and sugar damage in order for a cell to be flat. That's actually not a resting position. A resting position for a cell is round. So when the cell flattens out, it's actually got this infrastructure, this little skeleton inside of cells, a cell made up in endothelial cells of vimectin and actin. And those are the two skeleton. Think of them as like the bones of the cell. And when those bones get rearranged in a particular way, that cytoskeleton flattens the cells out and allows them under that tense condition to be normal, to be good endothelial cells. Well, along comes nicotine, along comes sugar, and attaches to that cytoskeleton and damages the actin and the vimentin. And then what happens is that cytoskeleton collapses and these cells round up. And when they round up, there's little gaps here that expose the, something called the basement membrane. And the problem with that basement membrane is that's damage to the blood vessels and they may leak. So the human body has this really cool system called the intravascular clotting system. When certain elements of, that are floating around in the blood see damage, see a hole, they go in there and they plug the hole. They plug the hole and they form a fibrin clot and they activate the clotting cascade. And the clotting cascade has a number of factors that sequentially attract others. So you get factor one, factor two. Factor two is calcium. So very early on in that clotting cascade, you've got calcium deposition that activates, the calcium activates other clotting mechanisms, clotting factors to come in and form this fibrin clot. And then what happens is platelets come along and platelets get activated, they clump up and they seal up that clot, making it more of a permanent clot. And then the platelets activate neutrophils that come and get stuck in there and lymphocytes and then the lymphocytes bring in macrophages, and the macrophages have little molecules on them that attract fat. And the final thing that seals that clot, the speckle that seals that opening, that breach, is saturated fat. And the saturated fat, guys, is brought there by LDL. So when you open up that blood vessel, what you see is this remnant collection of saturated fat that's now clogging the blood vessels, but it started out as an injury from nicotine and started out as an injury from glucose. And then you've got this clot and this gelatinous snot. Okay, now what is a CAC score? Well, a coronary artery calcium score looks at how much calcium there is layered in those blood vessels because this is a repetitive chronic injury. And every time there's an injury, you get more and more calcium being brought in. And what happens is those clots, when, when, the, when the body heals, and most often the body's going to heal those vessels, when it heals, the clot gets dissolved. The clot gets dissolved. And when that clot dissolves, you still get a little bit of calcium left behind, but everything seals up and the calcium is stuck to the basement membrane. So you get this accumulation slowly over time as there's repetitive injury of calcium attaching to the base membrane. And we can measure that because it lights up. Calcium's like bone. It lights up on certain imaging studies. 
So when you get a CT scan of your chest, the CT scans are so cool because they can see that bony formation of calcium in your coronary blood vessels, the blood vessels of your heart. And they can tell how stiff those blood vessels are and make an assumption of narrowing of damage based on the thickness and the diversity, the percentage of damage, of chronic damage, is estimated based on that calcium score. It's so cool how people have worked this out. And we can now have a percentage or a score to tell you how dangerous your risk of developing a blood clot or a, a clot in that vessel, a narrowing, or a clot that completely occludes that blood vessel, which means that blood and nutrients and oxygen doesn't go downstream, and a little portion of your heart dies, and that's called a heart attack. So we can now predict, based on a CAC score, what your potential risk of a heart attack is. And, not, and the CAC score looks at all the different blood vessels in the heart, left anterior descending, your widow maker, your uh, right vessels. We look at all those vessels and then we come up with individual scores per vessel and we come up with a score for the entire heart. And it predicts cardiovascular risk. It's really, really cool. <coughs> so that is a way to look not just at the snot, that fatty stuff, but the calcium. And we can predict risk. And I use a CAC score in my patients we order it. If you want one, we can order that with the greatest of, of pleasure. Um, we do that as a form of fear because fear is a far greater motivator of change than, oh, I want to look better. I want the scale to go down. I want to fit into my, yeah, uh, uh, um, pleasure and, and feeling good is a motivator, but not such a prime motivator. But when you're afraid of that heart attack, Or if your doctor is like, well, your CAC score is so bad, you have to be on a statin, which doesn't do anything for that damage because it doesn't fix the damage. Then you say, okay, what do I do to reduce this? And of course, we want you to quit smoking if you can. And we want you to avoid carbohydrates if you can. And that's where we come in. We help you with that. So a CAC, that's what a CAC score does. Now, what are the other two tests that we can do to look at the same uh, blood vessels, because if you've had stents, if you've had stents put in there, the stents shower light on a CT scan, and you can't really see what the blood vessel looks like because the stent looks just like the calcium, and you can't get a good score. So the next level test, a test is um, a coronary artery angiogram or CTA, CT angiogram, where they actually inject dye and they can look at the narrowing of the blood vessels, which gives a very similar predictive score. And the final test that we do, I don't do it myself, that is where they put a needle either in a blood vessel in your arm or a needle in, in your groin blood vessel, and they actually put a catheter all up there and they can selectively inject dye into each blood vessel. And we typically do an angiogram when we want to be therapeutic as well, because what they then do is they see a narrow blood vessel and they then have these tiny balloons that can stretch that out or they can put a stent in. So we've got a CAC score for most people that is a good test of that vascular damage. Otherwise, a CTA, CT angiogram, and at worst, from a therapeutic perspective, a true invasive angiogram. Those are the three things that we do. I don't do the angiograms, but we can order the other two. And how does it help you? It doesn't really help you to change anything. If the CAC score is really bad, I would refer you to a cardiologist because that potentially may require a stent or a balloon. And you want to know that. But more importantly, I use it as motivation. As motivation to say, hey, this is serious. We've got to do something about it. We can also look at the uh, carotid artery, but that's more important in smokers. But the coronary artery calcium score is very, very useful. Now, um, one of the questions we have, and we don't know the answer to this yet, is whether or not by going on a keto diet and getting rid of carbohydrates, assuming you're a non-smoker, whether or not you can improve your CAC score. I have five patients so far that we've tracked over the last two, three years, one of them actually longer, and we have seen an anecdotal improvement in CAC score. But that, that jury is still out. And I'm working with certain guys, uh, uh, David Diamond, Dave Feltman, 
um, Ivor Cummings, we're looking at this and trying to collect data to look at whether or not a CAC score actually improves. I don't know that. But what I can predictably tell you is your CAC score is not going to get worse if you don't eat carbohydrates. And then we can talk potentially, if I see if you've got a really bad CAC score, is there any value to using aspirin, to using Eliquis or Plavix or one of the blood thinners? And I've got thoughts on that as well. I'm not going to go into that over here. It's de it de depends on what that particular individual is doing. But don't discount those. Because all you need if you've got a high CAC score is one final little, little bit of this, and there's your heart attack. And we don't want you to have a heart attack while you're trying to improve your general health by going on a ketogenic diet, by cutting carbohydrates out of your life. But CAC scores are incredibly valuable. We order them. Sometimes your insurance pays for it. Sometimes you have to pay out of pocket. But you avoid 10 bags of potato chips. Well, maybe a little bit more than 10 or a few trips to McDonald's and you can pay for your CAC score. Your choice but give us a shout. Text us to 561-517-0642. Unfortunately, I can't just write the script for the CAC score. We have to have you on our books as a patient. And I'm not prepared to do a CAC score just because you want one. It comes together with our counseling. You may consider that a hook or whatever it is. Believe me, we are busy enough. It's an option for you, but I'm uncomfortable just doing the score and then letting you go off to the internet and interpreting it. I'd like to be able to give you the interpretation and triage you accordingly. So set up a visit with us. Set up a visit with us so that we can put it into context. Because I don't want to add to the keto evangelist fear mongering that's on the internet all the time. I hope this helps. I hope you think it through. If interested, give us a shout, but follow us on this YouTube channel, Carbaddiction. Please hit the subscribe button. And also, if you can, hit the like button. Why is that important? Because Google actually pays us when we have enough visits to these videos. I don't benefit from this at all. This is all nonprofit work. We have a nonprofit. It does pay, help to pay for the production of these videos. And we can bring you better and greater content if you help us in that regard. Thanks so much for your support. I hope this is of interest to you. Think about it, and we'll see you next time.